tonight, we have Bob Nelson with us. Um, before COVID hit, well before COVID hit, um, my husband Chuck um, started his second round of physical therapy. Um, he had worked with a physical therapist for well over a year. Things kind of stabilized and he toddled on and then um, things were starting to get a little dicier with Chuck's mobility and his balance. And he decided he wanted to go back into physical therapy. And um, there was a lot of take home work, things that he was supposed to do on his own. And I'll tell you truthfully, we've been married over 45 years, but my being the one to remind Chuck to say, you know, come on, let's do this, let's do it together. It just didn't feel right because um, I'm not I'm not a physical trainer. I'm not a personal trainer. Uh, so I kind of looked around and I came across Bob Nelson. And Bob struck me as somebody who was very interested in working with people who come with challenges. And that's that's our community. Um, he is shown us that he is very attentive to Chuck and Chuck's interests and Chuck's not getting bored and Chuck's making prog progress. He's been very attentive in terms of safety issues. Um, and he is a cool guy who comes from Portland, Oregon. And as mm -hmm. we all know, Portland is the city that's weird and cool people live there. So, you know, it's a, it's a trifecta of wonderful things that we found. So every three times a week, um, Chuck and Bob meet on Zoom. They have never been in the same room together. Um, and I thought, this is really quite remarkable. So that's why I, I asked Bob if he would talk about this concept of having a personal trainer who's not in the room with you. And I think um, I'm going to turn it over from this point. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today, Harriet. Thank you for setting this up and including me. Uh, and thank you, Chuck, for letting me work with you and um, letting me share our sessions together with people today. A little bit about me and my background. Um, I don't see it as so much separate careers, but my first career was in psychology. I have a master's degree in counseling. So I was a child and family therapist for a while. And then I went to massage school. So I'm uh, still a massage therapist. I don't practice as much, but I practice in the chiropractic clinic for a number of years, um, private practice, fitness centers, uh, YMCA, things like that. And then when the next change came around, I thought, what's, what's the missing piece here? I kind of had the mental health thing, um, the massage piece. And then about seven or eight years ago, the thing that was missing for me, I thought, was movement and exercise. And I saw that primarily in um, the chiropractic clinic that I worked at. I was working with a lot of people that were in motor vehicle accidents, um, sporting injuries, more of the clinical side of massage, which I liked, versus more of the relaxation part of massage. And I found that the people that were getting better were the people that tended to do things outside of the therapy session or the outside of seeing the chiropractor or outside of seeing me for massage. They're the ones that are doing their homework, doing their exercises, doing their stretching. And so for me, I wanted to find out a way, like how can I get that into my work and present that? So um, personal training came about. And then since then, as a personal trainer, as many fields, you're required to have so many continuing education hours every two years. And most recently I did a certification called um, uh, functional aging specialists, meaning kind of focusing on 55 and older crowd, which is pretty neglected in the fitness world. Um, you know, people that are in the senior years and especially people that have certain limitations, a traditional fitness model doesn't really work for them. So I'm excited to kind of bring that in. I've already started kind of integrating that with my, with, with Chuck and with other um, senior clients. So it's, um, it's just a way to look at fitness from a, from a functionality perspective. Okay, next slide. The first thing I wanna talk about are the benefits of exercise. I think we all, if you've worked with a trainer or if you've been an exerciser for most of your life or not, most people think of fitness as, oh, I'm, I'm gonna get stronger hopefully or better balance or I wanna have more endurance. 
I want to talk a little bit more about those next bullet points, core stability, some of these subtleties of fitness that most of us may not think about, or if you haven't had um, the experience of working with a physical therapist or a trainer, um, you might not know about these or why these are important. So if you think about core stability, so um, back in the day, the, the core was all about the abs, right? Like if you had washboard abs, you must be really strong. And it was very one dimensional. It was very uh, superficial and it didn't really address the function of your abs. So your abs are not just this part of your abs, but your ab muscles go deep into your torso and they actually help support your spine. So for people that are struggling with balance, stability, um, back injuries, different kinds of things like that, core stability is paramount. And for a lot of people, it's hard to access and it's not exercised the same way you would exercise um, a different part of your body maybe. It's not intuitive and so it takes some practice to find that position and find that, that place of core strength and the ability to kind of turn it on when you need to turn it on. So again, for those of you that struggle with, with balance and stability, this part of your body, and, and now core is kind of talked about as hips up to chest, three-dimensionally. So it's not just this one-dimensional ab kind of area. It's really three-dimensional, it's deep in. Um, and so core stability is the connection between lower body and upper body. Uh, think of it as kind of a foundation. So you'll you'll see in some of the videos with Chuck later on that I'm I'm helping him, teaching him how to access that. So then some of the other exercises become easier, and he's able to find that position of stability more quickly. We also think about exercise uh, having to do be, uh, beneficial for flexibility. Flexibility basically meaning how much length does the muscle have versus mobility, meaning how can I create movement through that joint given my flexibility that I have through that joint. And then we get into things like motor control. How do I tell my brain to tell my arm or whatever I'm trying to do to create that movement, um, work on coordination. So there's all these different subtleties of exercise that you may don't think of as um, more the, the surface level benefits of exercise. Another bullet um, that applies, I think, for a lot of people here, reaction time and fall prevention. And this was, I got to be honest, this was a challenge in working with Chuck because this was, uh, this was a new experience for me. And I took the lead from his physical therapist with the exercises that he was doing with him. But then the virtual thing, like how do I create safety? Um, how can I see... I can't see three-dimensionally. So how do I see different parts of his movement and help cue um, things that I want to see him do or things that I want to see him practice? So that was, so that was a challenge. Um, but you'll see in some of the videos, we set up systems and um, situations in his house of, hey, we're going to put you in the corner for this exercise and different ways to keep him safe and still be challenged enough to do what I was asking him to do. The last two points, actually the second last point, mood and stress reduction. This is something that is that I think a lot about, even though I don't practice as a therapist anymore. Benefits of exercise for mood and anxiety and depression are, are really beneficial. I mean, it's, there, it's just been proven, even I'll speak for myself on those, those times when I'm not in my exercise routine or I don't exercise for a while, like I just feel different. You know, and I feel better when I exercise. So even though we're talking about some a specific condition today, I want you to think about also the, the mood enhancement and the benefits of exercise that you can help out with some of the more emotional, mental side of, of life. And then finally, better sleep. I think most people say, hey, when I exercise more, I just sleep better. Okay, next, please. This is a question that get a lot, huh? you know, how often should I exercise? And I'm gonna use this quote from a physical therapist that I saw. He says, motion is the lotion. And literally, you know, motion creates um, uh, synovial fluid in your joints. It stimulates it, so it actually 
helps lubricate joints, um, increases blood flow. So motion begets motion, I think. The, the more immobile you are, the harder it is to get started. Um, the more you stay moving, the easier it is to stay in movement. In movement. So I encourage people, depending on what it is and your ability, you know, move every day as much as you can. Um, and that takes time to figure out what that is for you. And the CDC gives some recommendations. They did a study, I think this first one came out in 2007 or eight, uh, their recommendations. And it's pretty similar to what I have here that they say 150 minutes of aerobic activity, moderate aerobic activity. And they said that should be, you know, it can be spaced out. It doesn't need to be in big chunks. Um, so we can do it in, you can break it up into smaller parts and it can be whatever you do and whatever you're able to do to get your heart rate going. Now we'll take a pause here, I got a question. Yeah, it looks like uh, does Chuck sees physical therapist and personal trainer both is the question. That might be for Harriet to answer. Yeah. Harriet, oh. you want to answer that? I can answer. Sure, for you. sure. Actually, Chuck is sitting right next to me. I failed to introduce this this guy next to me. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Chuck. No, I'm not seeing physical therapist now. Well, not this week. This week we're in Washington D.C., well, so so there is no physical therapy this week or next. But typically, he sees a physical therapist once a week and has take home things to work on. Um, so um, yes, he does both in the course of a week. And that's, and that's really great because a lot of people don't have access to a physical therapist, right? And so, um, yeah, I think this is great that he's able to do that. And then I kind of supplement that with the exercises that he's doing. And then I add in things that I see other things that we can be doing to kind of enhance what what he's doing with his physical therapist. So as far as the recommendations, um, the CDC then also talks about this idea of um, two days of muscle strengthening. That's a little ambiguous, um, but the idea is any kind of uh, strengthening, be it your body weight. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about I use a lot of bands for people, and these are good for home exercise. If you have limited space, limited equipment, um, so anything to create resistance in your body. Some is better than none and you do what you can. And this is, if there's one key point I wanna, I hope you take away is that no matter what your situation is, exercises can always be modified. They can be made harder or they can be made easier. And so it doesn't matter where you're starting or what your abilities are. There's a, there's a way to do it that works for you. So just to, just to know that that's a, that's a possibility. And also this idea of 150 minutes, and if you're starting from zero, that seems really overwhelming. But you can really break it down into chunks. I have, I have one client, and um, she just has a busy lifestyle, and she just can't do a full half hour, hour. So we do, I give her two exercises. Like do these two exercises, but do them five times a day or whatever it is. So you can start off as small as possible, but then just to kind of build from there. Okay, next please. So this is a breakdown of a, of a progression of exercise variations, kind of starting from simple to more complex. So the, the interesting thing about fitness is there's, there's not a lot of new exercises that are being invented. <laughs> Maybe maybe somebody out there, but a lot of the the way we move our body can only move in so many directions. Our shoulder joint has so much motion it can do. There are certain things it can't do. So there's exercises that are based around movement patterns. Um, so we talk about squatting or um, pushing or pulling, and so all these kinds of foundational exercises can be regressed or progressed, you know, made easier or harder. And I'm gonna take you through uh, some, some examples with um, videos here with Chuck. So I'm just gonna, let's, let's, why don't we jump right into the next one, which is the seated exercise. So typically we'll do a little bit of a warm up before we get into the the meat of a, of a workout routine. And so 
this is a seated exercise just to kind of get and if you want to join in right now you can just do it do it with chuck in the video we're just kind of doing this back and forth alternating sides part of it is just to get some movement going get some blood flowing warm up a little bit there's a little coordination element involved doing this cross pattern this kind of mimics a walking or a locomotion pattern so that's one seated exercise that we do Can you feel like your calves oh yeah exactly there. So now I'm showing Chuck what we call a, a heel raise or a calf raise. So one thing that I always make sure to check in is asking, like, where do you feel this? What do you what do you notice? Where do you feel it? And if he doesn't feel it where you should be feeling it, then that gives me a chance to correct a little bit and say, like, hey, let's move your move your feet out a little bit or like move it into a different position. This is another one. Um, a way to progress this then might be. Okay, now we're going to have you stand and you're going to be standing up against the wall, hands against the wall, and then he's pushing up on his toes from that position. Okay, next. Can you feel like your calves? Can you feel like your calves? Oh, yeah, exactly. There. Can you feel like your calves? Sorry, let me find out how to. There we go. So now we're doing a little sidestep. So again, just getting, this is to work on hip strength. So hip strength is really important in stability. If you don't have strong enough hips, then balance coordination is really affected. So this is from a seated position. Then again, imagine this being in a standing position. Also, I use these mini bands a lot. They're um, different resistances. So sometimes, depending upon um, ability, this could be put around your knees or, in this case, around ankles and standing up and being able to have some support so you're feeling safe and secure. And then one leg would go off to the side. So again, this is kind of a progression from a seated to standing. Okay, next. So this is a, a knee extension. So if you ever spent any time in a gym, you've seen these machines where you have your a roller on your leg and then the weight stack is behind you and you're doing a knee extension. So what's challenging about this is, and I'm gonna reference this a bit, the core stability that I talked about earlier. Challenge with this is that tendency to wanna slide back like this. So even though you're seated, you still can get a really good core workout in these positions. Having the idea of like trying to pull your belly button towards your spine. So you're engaging this deep area that I talked about that supports and stabilizes your spine. And then trying to lift from that position and so in these seated positions, again, really still you can work these core muscles by just stand, sitting tall, working at engaging that feeling, what that feels like, and then you extend as far as you can. And if you have to lean back, you have to. But again, the idea is that we can still work this area even from a seated position. Okay, next. All right, now we're getting into the floor stuff. So here we are, this is um, what's called a single leg bridge. So this is a pretty good, this is a little advanced exercise. So a, a bridge is where you're, you're pushing your hips up towards the ceiling. So an easier version of this would be both feet on the floor. And then if you imagine squeezing your butt as you're pressing your hips towards the ceiling. So what I'm doing at Chuck here is a single leg which is a little more challenging. And you'll see he's pressing up on his right foot. So you're using that heel to press into the floor. And the challenge is there's a tendency for the body, since you're just on one leg, your, your hips and your torso want to shift side to side. 
another really great core exercise is by engaging your core, you're helping to really stabilize that torso. So then when you're pressing up on that one side, you want to minimize the side to side shift. This too really affects balance and stability when taking into a standing position. Then. Okay, next. Uh, here's a good old plank. So plank is another core exercise focus. It's 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 really kind of a whole body exercise. I, I think I, I feel that for myself. It takes a lot to engage all those muscles. And again, just to take you through a progression of this, a simpler version would be doing it against the wall, where you're you're up against a wall, and then you just slowly would you would move your feet further away from the wall again still staying safe and trying to not let your back hyper extend so think of walking the plank you want to keep that nice rigid position so this is up on all on um, hands and then another challenging one we've done is having chuck go down on his elbows i don't think i have that one but if you picture the more horizontal your body gets, the harder it gets. So again, starting off in more of a vertical position and the lower you go, the more challenge. There's another version that you can do this on your knees too, which is a little bit easier than, than this position. Okay, next. Uh, this is called a bird dog. So if you picture a bird dog pointing at a, a duck, a goose. <laughs> um, this is, uh, I gotta say, this is the one exercise that I've seen um, the most progress with for Chuck. It's been, it's been really great to be able to watch the progression of this. When we first started doing it, and again, a way to progress this is keep your hands on the floor and just extend one leg at a time. So as you're extending one leg, again, still kind of keeping this core stability. And then you add this opposing arm and leg. So when we first did this, you know, Chuck was falling, you know, it was, it was tough to keep that balance. And, and I remember Chuck, he told me too, it was kind of a coordination thing. It's like this, it's kind of like that cross pattern we did at the, the video I showed at the start. It's that same thing where your cross, your opposing arm and leg are doing the movement. And again, I'll bring it up again. The, the core is what keeps that stability. If you don't have core stability, you can't stay in that balanced position. So this is a really great core stability exercise coordination. And again, depending upon your ability, if you can get on the floor and do things on the floor, you do this and just extend one leg at a time. Okay, next. Uh, here's some fun props. Um, so this is a, a kneeling exercise and it's called a, a hip hinge. So if you can see how all of the movement is coming from Chuck's hips, his spine is nice and straight. It's relatively safe because he's on the floor and he's got enough balance to maintain that position. I encourage a lot of support, so have good, some good pads around. And so with the hip hinge, what we're working here again, our hips, low back, and then the challenge with the band is that the band's also strengthening back of your shoulders between shoulder blades. This is what I, I mentioned earlier, the idea of movement patterns, some being a push, some being a pull. So this is a pull. So the band is actually pulling him forward and he has to stabilize. He has to use the back of his body, hips, low back to keep from falling all the way forward. And then as he's, as he's coming up, kind of squeezing hips and then rowing in. So it's a great, it's really a full body exercise because you're getting hips, you're getting upper body, you're getting this row in there. Um, a lot of people, all ages, as we, as we age, as we decline, we 
become more inward, will become more flexed. All the years of work, driving, posture, injury, whatever it is, how do we counter that? We have to counter that movement. So this is a great movement. And this is something you could just do without a band. You know, if you're just sitting in a chair, think about that hinging at your, at your waist, not rounding, hinging and coming forward just to use your own body weight to get in that position and get to get that benefit. I love, this is a great exercise. And, and actually to talk about equipment, you can see Chuck has a little um, eye hook on the wall there. So there's different versions of bands. That band he has is pretty similar to mine, where it's just a loop. You may have or know there's other um, tubing bands like this that have handles. And these actually have door anchors, so you can put it in a door and then close your door and it locks in the door. So then if you're in a chair or standing up, um, you can use those bands that way. Okay, next. So now we're talking about assisted exercises. Uh, this was an exercise his physical therapist gave him and and it was it was really great. It was really helpful for me because I was trying to think of how do we how do we get the same benefit again, trying to kind of work the backside a little bit and still to the distance when you come back to the wall. I'm giving them a little correction there just to keep them safe. I said, hey, use your hand to feel the wall when you're coming back to the wall, um, just so he knows how much space he's got behind him so it doesn't fall back too far. So this is called a hip peel. So you're peeling your hips off first and then your shoulders come. Again, the progression of this is just if you're able to stand tall, it may be easy. Then if you need to gauge the distance when you come back to the wall. The further away you take your feet, and as you can see, he has trouble sometimes getting up. So you really have to really squeeze your squeeze your hips to get yourself up. So your hips come first and then your shoulders. And then I just had him do a little movement at the wall and then walk backwards. So there's a lot of balance involved, um, hip strength, stability, another really a good exercise. And it's, again, if you're, if you're able to be in this position, a safe way to do it against the wall. Okay, next. Uh, this is the classic, we call it a monster walk. So if you can see, Chuck's got a little mini band around his knees. And these mini bands are, are really effective. And there's, there's two kind of ways that I use them or another way that his physical therapist used to. So this band that he has on there, the, the idea is that I'm going to stand up here so you can see me, hopefully. So one thing happening is that his right knee caves in a little bit. So that's a hip strength thing. So I'm trying to get him to um, push that knee out. And I tell him a lot, keep that knee out, keep that knee out. So one thing that the band does, if the band's tight enough, it will pull you further into the position you don't want. And some people say, and mentioned to me that it gives them it gives them something to push against. So even though your body may be saying, I don't, I don't, I don't get this, I don't understand this, or you may not be able to feel what I'm asking, the the resistance on the band of squeezing the legs um, sometimes gives you feedback, like, oh, oh yeah, I'm supposed to push against this. So my cueing of keep your knees out. And his physical therapist uses a good analogy of imagine your hips, your knees, your feet are on a railroad track. So if your feet, hips, knees are all lined up, that's a good position to be in. So having this band, again, is forcing him to engage that hip. Uh, I think on the, let's go to the next slide. I think there's another slide with the, another band version. Yeah, so this is a similar exercise, but now we're going sideways. We got a question here. Would you like me to read that for you, Bob? Sure. Um, sure. So uh, my husband's in a wheelchair, has to be transferred 
Um, also 90% blind. I have a personal trainer who comes in three days a week and an OT who's beginning uh, core strength. Are there any exercises you would suggest for people who can't stand? Um, yeah, this person's uh, husband can do about 10% of what Chuck can do is what they're saying. Yeah, let's see here. I'm just, I'm just rereading. Yeah, so I think one thing is if you're chair bound, these bands, and, and you may need some help, um, but one way to use a band is if you can get, and let me show you a different version of this too. If you can have them sitting up and have this band around knees, and we do these on the ground, but also just doing a, what's called like a seated clamshell. So hips are, uh, knees are opening wide to help get some hip engagement. Maybe a two second count to see how that feels. Um, just as a way to get some movement in the lower body from that seated position. Um, and, we'll, and we'll do some seated stuff at the end. I'll talk about a little bit about like breathing and how to do some abdominal bracing that might help too. And uh, reach out later too for other ideas. So the idea with this band is his trainer gave him a really light band. So the idea here is that it's so lightweight, it would just fall to the floor if he didn't keep his knees out. So again, different ways to use bands. If it's too loose, you still gotta keep your knees out to keep it up. Or if it's a little bit tighter, then you have something to push against. And this is called just a, a sidestep. Um, and you can see he's using his ski bowl or cane there to, to support himself. Again, it can be progressed in different ways. You could hang on, do this hanging onto a counter, um, a railing, something like that. You could do it in place, stepping out one side and then to the other side. All right, now let's do that stagger. So one foot's in front, one's in back. So this is a balance exercise. So I'm, what I'm talking about here is foot position. And you'll see here that we use uh, the corner of the, of the wall, I think, with Chuck. And then on a one to 10 scale, how does that feel today? Maybe a six or seven. Six or seven, okay. Yeah, so I'm always in communication, like balance wise, how are you feeling today? On a scale of one to 10, what does it feel like? Because that's, because of the nature of the online world, I may not be able to see everything that's going on. So I, I like to be in communication about like, how does that feel? What are you noticing? Um, different things like that. Are you getting fatigued? Are you getting tired? I want to be able to check in on that stuff so I can, you know, quickly say like, hey, let's take a break if needed. So in this position, um, if you're able to, if you're able to stand and maybe, maybe your feet wide is, is easy. Maybe it's six or seven. If your feet are staggered, it becomes more challenging. If feet are tandem, even more challenging. So I usually do an assessment with people when I first meet with them to see where is your balance at. Yeah. And then and then we work at that at that at that position of where are you most kind of challenges to to get enough stimulation to challenge the system to um, adapt and improve versus you know keeping them keeping them safe keeping you safe. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge. There has to be enough stimulation to kind of get the body to respond um, without, again, but also, you know, obviously not wanting to create injury or fall or anything like that. Okay, next. So I'm sure many of you are, you know, curious about like, how has this helped? And I'll, and I'll let Harriet and Chuck chime in if they'd like. Um, the, the things that I see, and I've been working with Chuck now for it's been it's been pretty close to almost spot on a year, I think. Um, as I mentioned, the the bird dog idea, like that thing, is the the most obvious visual visual for me was that the coordination and the balance was much better in that exercise. And does that translate directly to um, his functionality? Maybe you know, maybe I don't know for sure, but I think it does. Um, it has it's kind of a, a crossing pattern. Um, and also just, I think, more body awareness. If you, if you have or haven't exercised much before, 
a lot of this type of fitness and exercise and these exercises, it takes a lot of mindfulness. Like you gotta be really conscious about what you're doing. Um, and, and again, I, I try to cue things to elicit what I'm trying to have him do, but it really takes a lot of, um, mindfulness and awareness on the clients and to, to do those things. Uh, Harriet, you, your Chuck, have any want to comment on any of these? I think one of the things that Chuck's physical therapist is, is working with him on and you are supplementing tremendously is this issue of posture. It's very easy. There is in fact, kind of a typical APBD posture that, that um, our patients tend to start to adopt. They kind of crouch over more um, and you do that. Well, first of all, it's not good for your back just in general. And then if you add to that any kind of um, instability or unbalancedness, um, you lose your balance. If you're crouched over, what's going to hit the floor first? I can tell you it's not your knees. It's going to be your head. Yeah. So um, you, you and the physical therapist have really been cueing Chuck about posture. And I see a difference there, a tremendous difference there. So, yeah. you know, safety is the name of the game. That is, that's a big one for me. Yeah. And I think some of the, for me, and this, this applies maybe to Chuck, but also to other people too, I think is just the, the socialization piece of it. I mean, I kind of, we kind of, you know, we talk, we engage and we have conversations and especially with COVID, I think that's something that's, you know, really important because we're so isolated. Um, and so my, <laughs> I think it's my personality, personality, but also just my education and background. I'm, I'm curious and I want to be supportive. And I think it's hard to do in this COVID world right now. And so I think some of these things of how to, and, and also to help him be independent too. You know, we have, we have our sessions, you know, 10 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he's ready, you know, he's ready to go. If he's not, I'll check in. And so I think there's a lot of independence that he, I, yeah, I think that, that, that he's able to, to just kind of like, hey, I'm doing this on my own, I'm seeing Bob. And, um, and I think it's really helpful to kind of have that, yeah, have that kind of structure set up. Great. We've got a, another question for uh, Harry and Chuck. What does Chuck do for cardio? Can he speed walk or jog? Chuck was a runner. Chuck ran the Portland Hills for many, many years. And um, as APBD took its toll, it was not safe for Chuck to continue running. He, he was falling. And, you know, it's hard to watch and it's hard for him to say it's something that he loved so much he couldn't do anymore, but he is not running now. So I'll leave it to you, Bob. What do you, what do you call cardio out of, out of Chuck's routine? Yeah, and we, you know, and to be honest, we don't do it a lot of it. We do a little bit in the, some of those warm up routines, depending upon the day. Um, some exercises take a little more energy, like we do. Um, uh, we do a little goblets. We call it a goblet squat. So you have a dumbbell holding it like this, and so he's doing squats in a chair, and so that takes a little. You know, that gets your heart rate up a little bit. Um, I think some of the in, in my studio here, I don't have, and I have a a spin bike. But I think some of the the cardio equipment that I that I like that can be helpful um, and that's that's safe again, depend upon your ability, are some of the um, they're like an elliptical, but they also have um, arms. So again, I'm talking about this this pulling motion that I talk about. So instead of just doing the legs, um, and you can get them that have ones that have like a chair seat. So they're pretty, they're pretty stable. So you're doing your legs and then you can do your arms at the same time. So I have another client and she's been considering those. And I think they're, um, again, for people that have limited mobility and they're a little safer than some bikes that are, you know, take a little more stability to balance on. Uh, but, I, but, I, but again, I encourage people to get the ones that have arms. And on some of, the, some of them, you can actually turn the arm portion off so you can just hold on to them. Um, but I think they're nice because they then you're getting a little bit of upper body going on as well as cardio and lower body. I have a question for you, Bob. I'm relaying on behalf of somebody in the audience. So the issue is working out to ex exhaustion versus working out hard versus working out medium. Yeah. 
what are your thoughts on working to exhaustion? Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan, not a big fan of working to exhaustion. I think it's, um, yeah, I think if you're, you know, younger people that don't have any other issues um, or conditions, but it's just, it's, um, I know for, I don't know if Chuck's ever had that with any of our sessions, but I think there's, um, there's a fine line and, 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 and I, and I, what I usually say is, you know, was that easy, moderate, hard? And I try and keep them in the moderate zone most of the time, because I think if you if you're working to exhaustion, and I and I don't know enough about APBD to 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 speak to that directly, but I think that exhaustion. Imagine the exhaustion um, recovery time would be extended. You know, it would take a long time to recover from a really tough tough workout. Um, so I I kind of like to to stay on the on more of the moderate side of things. Um, I'll say I'll, I'll caveat that though with one thing that I know, um, but also the strength piece. Um, and I think I, I talked to Chuck's physical therapist one time, and I think he has him doing like some light presses and some more traditional kind of um, fitness machines. I think is that true, Harriet? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's you know he can lift some weight. So there's there's a again keep the safety in mind, keep the proper form in mind and with that being said still still challenge yourself and and challenge can be um it can be a coordination challenge it can be a strength challenge so again i think chuck's physical therapist you know he challenges him with weight like you know you're able to do these things when you're when you're in a safe you know contained position so i think for um for 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 people with apbd or and also just aging I think there's a tendency to kind of shy away from like, oh yeah, I don't want to get injured. I don't want to hurt myself. But if it's done in a you know controlled, safe environment, um, it's really important to kind of challenge those those things. Uh, one thing um, Chuck's physical therapist brought up to me too is that he's he's having him do jumps. Uh, and I know Harriet, that was a little ner ner nerve wracking at first, right? Yes. But, but yes. He uses his uh, um, walker and the brakes are on. And one thing that, that I read about recently is that, that I didn't know when I was going through school is that we lose, we lose power more quickly than we, use, than we lose strength, I believe it is. Power meaning your one example of power is catching yourself if you, if you fall. Like if you have to quickly respond, that's a, that's a power move. You know, we think of power moves as, you know, people throwing weight around and stuff like that. But there's also power as we age. If you don't have that quick reaction time to catch yourself or to brace yourself, um, you know, you're going to fall. So how to safely train this category of power. Um, and so we just do these little mini hops with him on his walker, jumping up, up and down on, on his feet. A little more challenging if you're not able to do that, but there's there's more evidence that this this aspect of power really declines more than more than strength. Training, I'll quickly go through this. So, so this online training world just kind of happened um, relatively quickly. Unfortunately, I had um, did another certification a couple of years ago to do online training because the fitness guru saw that was kind of a, a shift that was happening. Uh, so. The way I do it is through Zoom, and you know, usually it's one-on-one. -on -one. I do some partner training, and partner training is usually best done if people are kind of at the same ability. Um, and then I do some small groups as well. And one thing that I use that, that uh, Chuck doesn't use, but I, I use it with all my clients is that I, I have an app that I use. So I program all exercises and work workouts into this application. So it's a way for me to track things, track progress, list workouts, list exercises. And then depending upon how often people are able to see me, if people can't come three times a week, they still need to be doing stuff on their own. So they have the app and they can, whatever equipment they have set up at home, um, I program in workouts and exercises that they can do. So then in between our sessions, they still know like, hey, I'm supposed to be doing this thing. And so it's a way for me to um, help them be accountable. 
And then the little video clips that are included. So if you're not sure what an exercise is, you can see a little clip of me or some other person. Um, and then it's a way to just kind of like stay on top of things if you're not able to, to come in as, as regularly. Um, depending upon your, your mobility and, and space, um, as you can see here in my studio, you know, if I'm, if I'm demonstrating, I'll be standing back here so you can see all of me. So, you know, six to 10 feet of space, maybe, again, depend upon what you're doing. If you're in a, if you're in a chair, then obviously you're going to be less space. Um, and then important for good audio and camera. A lot of people use their laptops. Um, you know, Chuck uses his phone and he's got a little tripod so he can easily move it around if he needs to. And so it's important for you to obviously to, to see me, um, but then for me to see clients as well. Equipment, starting off, you don't really need anything. Um, there's a lot of body weight exercises that you can just do on your own. Um, and I kind of explain all that stuff to people. And then, you know, especially the first, you know, month or so is, is a lot of learning about these foundational movements that I talked about. Um, but then progressing to, as I mentioned earlier, getting some of these bands, and these are easily found on Amazon or fitness stores, different types of bands. Um, I mentioned the type that fit in the doorway. There's another uh, band, uh, Suspension Straps, TRX is a brand. Um, they have a, they're fixed, they don't stretch. So you can um, do exercises from a chair, you can do them standing, and they're a little different than the bands and that they just don't, they don't flex as much. Bob, we've got another question that's come in. What do you think about Xterra Fitness RXX 1500 bike? Uh, uses the arms and legs at the same time. How long should one use it per day? Ah, um, I, don't know if I, I don't know about that specific brand. It sounds familiar though, because I was doing some research for this other client about these, um, yeah, looking for these 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 brands that um, have the arms and legs going on. Um, so I can't, I can't sp specifically speak to that brand. Um, but I think as far as how much to do, depends on where you're at. Um, I, when it comes to aerobic activity, so I, I'm, a, I'm a runner, so I do some run coaching. So a lot of beginning runners, and I think this applies to anybody beginning, on a scale of one to 10, you know, if you are on your trainer or your bike or whatever, the aerobic zone is kind of in this five to six range. So you know, a lot of aerobic capacity is based on your um, maximum heart rate. Uh, you know, assuming heart's all good, you've been okayed and everything like that by your doctor, uh, this, this aerobic range and what CDC is talking about, this kind of moderate aerobic range, I would say like, you know, yeah, kind of 50% of your max, meaning um, a good way to test that is, could you carry on a conversation with somebody if you're on your on your bike or your trainer, you should be able to maintain conversation. If you're, you know, short sentences, um, especially starting off, that's probably a little a little too intense. So using this what we call an RPE rating of perceived exertion, I just keep it on a one to ten scale. One's easy, tens full out sprint. Um, keep it in that kind of mid range, four to six again, especially starting out. I had another question, Bob, and that is, um, have you worked with anybody who does passive exercise? In other words, as APBD progresses, um, folks find that they can do, the, you know, their, their nerves are just not firing. Yeah. So um, ha have you had any experience with what's called passive exercise equipment? Um, I have not. Okay. And is it, yeah, is it specific equipment that's just, is it, is it moving the person? Right. So for example, a person is seated and their feet are in a, something that looks like a bicycling position, pedals, yeah. but rather than the person doing the power, the machine, it is a powered machine. Same Got thing for, for hands and arms because APBD can, for some people, affect their arms and hands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you have not had experience with that, we won't we won't prolong that question. Yeah. But let's begin. Let's do it. Okay. Show us what you would have somebody seated doing. 
Yeah, so so just for sake of time and just to keep it simple, um, this is kind of a, some of those uh, warm ups that you saw earlier on in the video. And I'm going to show you from the side this idea about bracing your abs. So it's really it's really easy to you know kind of sit relaxed, letting your chair support you. But I want you to think about sitting tall. And as you're sitting there, kind of think about pulling this idea of like slightly pulling your belly button towards your spine. So you're kind of pulling your abs in, but still being able to breathe. So you're not holding your breath. So there's a little bit of, a little bit of tension in your abs. And then so this is the kind of start position for everything. So on the first move we're going to do are called heel taps. So if you can um, safely as you can be kind of on the edge of your chair, and then you're just going to tap one heel, tap the other, and try and keep that nice tall posture. Try to minimize leaning back if you can. And if you want to add in the hand thing that I was doing with Chuck, you can alternate. So as you extend one knee, you're touching that opposite side. Still focusing on that idea of keeping your abs engaged. And then if you imagine if this is easy, you can make it more challenging by just going quicker. So that turns into a little bit more of a cardio type thing. Again, depend upon your ability. It can be kind of a warm up, but then it can also be like, oh, I'm going to get my heart rate up a little bit. All right, now we're going to go to a full knee extension. So similar, keeping those abs in, but then you're going to actually lift your legs or your heels not touching. Got a couple questions. I just want us to answer one. Yes, we're recording this webinar and it will be available to participants afterwards, as will the slides. So this one you should feel on your thighs. Feel the burn, guys. <laughs> feel it? Who's feeling it? This part will not be um, kept in the recording. This is just for us to have tonight. This is where we're on camera. Okay, now we're going to do a little um, twist. Again, I'm still thinking about that attention in your abs. Hand goes opposite knee. And then you're just going to do a gentle little rotation to the side. And then back to the center and keep it keep it simple, keep it easy so you're not forcing your twist. So we're trying to work a little mobility in the lower mid spine. How long do you hold it for? Uh, maybe like two seconds. And then just as an experiment, what if you let your let your core go, just kind of slouch a little bit and just feel how that feels different. Like to me, I feel like I actually have less range of motion the more relaxed I am. True. So the more engaged, I feel like I can get a little more. All right, now we're going to do some upper body. Remember, I was talking about that push-pull idea. So you're going to, I'm going to, and I'm starting with my fist closed here. So we're going fist closed, and then you're going to open as you go overhead, and then squeeze back down, and then you're going open out, like you're doing a push, and then elbows back so you're really squeezing your shoulder blades together and then you go down and then back here back to up 
back to here. Squeezing back and down. Back up. And this can be, this may feel easy, this may feel hard, but if you really squeeze and kind of create more tension, it becomes kind of hard. Like you can create tension through your body just by really forcing muscles to contract. Can you feel that? Does that make sense? So the slower you go, you can create more tension, more activation of the muscles. All right, how about one more? This one I call a clock exercise. So Chuck and I do this standing, but we're gonna do it seated. So if you imagine you're the center of the clock. So you got 12, nine, six, and three. So you're gonna be on the edge of your chair again. And you're just gonna go, like let's go left, left foot to 12. And then left foot goes to nine. And then left goes to six. Back to 12. Nine. Six. Nine, I'm mixing it up on you. Nine, six, 12, nine, 12, six, nine, six, 12. All right, other side. So you can imagine this is a, if you're standing, this would be a really challenging balance exercise. So we do it with, um, Chuck's got a pole or ski pole or does it against the wall. So now right side's going 12, three, six. And if you can't get your foot under your chair as much as you can, 12, three, six, three, 12, six, three, 12, three, six, 12, six, three. All right. That gives you a little taste of some of the things you can do from a seated position. Bob, you are remarkable. I want to thank you for giving us this hour of your thoughts and encouragement. You can contact Bob at bob at bobfitpdx.com. Bob Nelson has a free 21-minute chair workout on YouTube with more seated exercises. You can find it at this link here. And lastly, you should clear all exercise programs with your health care provider and or physical therapist before you begin. Thank you for attending this session.